update that we saw in the video. He was playing a game in VR. He was driving a car in Grand Theft Auto in virtual reality using a headset Tesseract. And you can see how immersed he was in the game that he actually felt that the controller he was holding was steering him and he was moving with it. So that is how powerful and like, stupid our human brain is. <laughs> so uh, in very simple terms, uh, sensory organs, they act like antenna. They receive signals, they convert them to some, a different format, they route it to the brain, and then the brain processes these signals and allows us to perceive the reality as we see. Now what virtual reality does is it uses this very vulnerability of the human brain. If you can simulate the signals that our brain receives in a format that is compatible with, then you can allow us to perceive a completely different reality altogether. Now this complete concept might seem pretty stupid to understand, but when you get into the technological details behind it, you realize how extremely difficult it is to simulate something even fractionally resembling the actual reality. And the amount of information that the brain processes every single moment and how powerful, complex and beautiful that the reality we perceive is. You must have heard about several virtual reality headsets that are coming in the market. However, developing content specifically for each and every hardware in itself is a direct detriment to the amount of content that is available to experience to the users in a technology as nascent as virtual reality. I'm not sure how many of you have actually heard about the term virtual reality or the concept of virtual reality, but uh, most of you I don't think have. So that's the whole point. The technology is in its infancy and in order to promote this technology, you need to have available content to be demonstrated to the users. However, digital technology is not that young. Immersive, engrossing content already exists in the digital archives of the world, which has the power to captivate the audience. And when we realized this very concept, we knew exactly what to do. So we developed a technology which can use the digital content that has been developed for the past several decades and port it to virtual reality, real time. So you can play games like Counter Strike, GTA, Dota, FIFA, any game. You can watch movies from Gunda to Mission Impossible. You can watch YouTube videos. Even images would do. <coughs> any of the existing content can be experienced in virtual reality using the technology. And the beauty of it is that we do it in real time giving a frame rate of almost 60 plus FPS. So, um, so when we began to uh, work in this field, we realized, th the more we work, the more we realize we have a lot to cover. And eventually, the uh, we, we kept aside all our priorities and we, direct, we just devoted our entire time and mind to the project that we were working on. Proof of concept, prototyping, fundraising. We were hardly 20 years old back then. And we were traveling from city to city, in random buses, ra general compartment <coughs> trains, and living an extremely frugal lifestyle. Just to raise funds. In order to kickstart this baby of ours that we had nurtured for the past one year. In order to enable the users to experience virtual reality as it is without having to invest thousands of dollars before having their first films of it. In order to enable this promising <coughs> technology to reach the masses, who we know are more than willing to welcome a new era of digital communication and interaction. Because we have seen so many people completely going nuts on having their first virtual reality experience in Tesseract. They're all smiling and screaming and they're fidgeting when they come back to the real life. But most of all, they're all wanting for more. I get to share a very funny incident from back in college life when we were working on a project and there was a single IC missing. So it was between our exams going on and um, a, a, a three day delay due to logistic factors was something we were not able to accept. So the same night we boarded a train to Mumbai, uh, there were no tickets available. So we just jumped into the general compartment, went to Mumbai, went to Langton Road, bought all the ICs that we wanted, tested it in a small little restaurant around, 
and then took a train back the same night in general compartment again because of no tickets available. And we did it not once. I don't even remember how many times we took these haphazard decisions because there were single components missing and ICs missing to complete our circuit and test our proof, uh, test our prototype, just to get our hardware ready. And we enjoyed every single moment of these haphazard decisions and random trips. Because now that I think of it, those two days that we saved every single time, <coughs> they matter equally important to us as they did back then. Over the past few months, we met several experts from different <coughs> sectors of industries. Automobile, aerospace, real estate, um, retail, furnishing, almost every sector you can think of. And what we realized was virtual reality has applications in almost every sector you can think of. And going out and showcasing our technology to a wide spectrum of people has made us realize that <coughs> VR is indeed in its infancy, clueless about what the future holds for it. And meeting these experts and developing skills as extensions of our individualism from technical, marketing, management, manufacturing, finance, law, and so many others, we are finally in a stage where we can nurture this infant VR and build a complete ecosystem of next level VR content around it. Haptic feedback and more, much other intuitive input devices will come into the consumer market in the recent future. Several are under development right now. However, unless they are in complete sync with the human body, problems like simulator sickness will plague the user experience. But that does not mean that virtual reality as it is today cannot be enjoyed. Our eyes and our ears, they form most of the information that, they make up most of the information that we receive. They are our primary guiding sensory inputs. Being human, or rather any human being for that matter, means to respond to stimulus. And the power of virtual reality, it lies in how it allows us to control the stimulus. And simulating these signals in completely immersive environments but is really a brilliant immersive experience. As a culmination of the bits and pieces of knowledge that we gathered over the past one and a half year, we also thought of experimenting the applications of virtual reality in the field of meditation. So visualizing music with psychedelic displays and using binaural beats for added immersion, we combine a set of frequencies which can alter the human moods and then research on the effect that they have. So we got to know that just 15 minutes of use can allow us to study better, sleep better, exercise better, or even breathe better, depending on the frequency range that you're tuning into. On similar lines, there's an entire spectrum of how virtual reality can be used as a tool in research and treatment, apart from entertainment purposes. Psychology and behavior therapy have the most to take from, from VR because of the direct interaction that it has with the human brain. Case studies of successful treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and war weapons have already been made. People suffering from vertigo have been successfully treated with their condition. People with anxiety and stress have reported better moods after VR therapy. There are several researches going on in how virtual reality can be used for virtual surgeries and more. However, this field of virtual reality and the progress that we are seeing in the 21st century is not something sudden. The concept originated almost 200 years ago. The earliest attempt at virtual reality, it was 360 degree murals, <coughs> academic paintings, back in 1812. Eventually, there came stereoscopic images, stereoscopic viewers, simulators, head-mounted devices, motion-tracking head-mounted devices, and so many other things. However, the term virtual reality, it was coined very recently in 1987. And then came the VR glasses, the virtual boy. And now, fast track to 2016, where the hardware and the software have finally reached a stage where they can be used by the consumer market. Over the next few years, we'll see several researches, over the next few years, we'll see several researches in the field of virtual reality. 
miraculous recoveries from mental and, in, mental and emotional disorders will be possible. Distances between loved ones will be reduced when you can immerse yourself in a virtual environment with each other over video or VR or holographic conferences. Social, network, social networking will regain the face-to-face -face human interaction that we've lost in the past few years. A completely different understanding of reality will evolve. The ultimate VR system will be able to manipulate the existence of matter in the surrounding it has control over. The electronic systems will develop to an extent where they will be structurally similar to the human body parts. The lenses will be uh, able to fo change their focus real time just like our eyes do. And all these researches are going on right now as we speak of it. The, the SimCity uh, Sim will look just as real as the world we are living in. It will be a completely immersive environment, just like our world right now. We will be able to feel, touch and smell virtually. And I am not just randomly aiming arrows in the air. Everything is in research right now and we will see the results of this in the next few years. The complete understanding of virtual reality reality will come into scrutiny when the virtual world will come closer and closer to the perceived world. And when that happens, how do you differentiate the virtual world from the perceived world? Getting into the philosophy of the existentialism, we just might be in a virtual world, come to think of it. Thank you.